Hello and welcome to the second instalment of the Health and Safety Matters podcast. I'm Mark Sennett. I'm the CEO of Western Business Media, the publisher of Health and Safety Matters. We're delighted that this podcast is sponsored by the Health and Safety event, which takes place on the 22nd and 23rd of September 2020 at the NEC in Birmingham. As you'll probably know, if you're listening to this, you can find out all the latest health and safety news from the UK health and safety sector on the Health and Safety Matters website, which is www.hsmsearch.com. Dot com. On this edition of the Health and Safety Matters podcast, I'll be joined by Kevin Bridges, who's the head of health and safety and a partner of Pinson Mason's solicitors, and Sam Hill, who's the managing director of Delta Plus. But as always, we start off with the news. And for me, it's pretty obvious what the top story of the last couple of weeks has been, and it's all about PPE. We've obviously seen in the news across the national media that um, the UK government acquired a huge amount of PPE equipment from Turkey that wasn't adequate and couldn't be used. And HSM actually partnered with the British Safety Industry Federation to deliver a webinar uh, at the start of the month. And this was all about ensuring that any PPE that's used is of the right and correct quality. You know, at the moment, the dangers of significant amount of non-compliant PPE coming into the market is growing and growing. And the BSIF webinar focused on how to ensure that it is CE marked, it is safe to use. And we had over 1,500 people join us and over 150 questions. One of the scary things that Alan Murray, the CEO of the BSIS, said during the webinar was the fact that since the start of the year in China, over 20,000 new companies have been launched with the word face mask in their name. It's truly worrying at the moment when we're in the middle of an epidemic where PPE is vital and the public are now well aware, probably the wider public for the first time of what PPE actually means and it's protecting the frontline workers, the key workers right now who are doing a wonderful job across the country. We need to ensure that they're protected and only protected by suitable PPE. And this webinar really went into great depth about how you can ensure that your PPE is safe and adequate to use. It's all about CE documentation and ensuring if it's genuine. And you can see the webinar just by going to our website and clicking on the webinars tab, which as I said before, is www.hsmsearch.com. But in addition, we've also published answers to a great number of those questions I said that have come in. There's, there's questions in there such as, if we advertise a mask as a non-medical social mask for use in the community, do they count as PPE? There's many, many other questions that you can go through. Also, other questions, because we had some international flavour to it. If we sell masks in the UK for use in the USA, does it still have to conform to UK standards? So anything about standards of PPE products, Go to the webinar, listen to it on demand for free as much as you want. Or, of course, you can look at the questions in the news section, which um, the news article is titled BSIF Publishes Answers to PPE Questions. So it was a fantastic webinar. Um, it was a great job that Roy Wilders and Alan Murray from the BSIF did, and I'd really encourage you to use it. But also, more importantly, you know there are many brilliant manufacturers in this country of PPE, and PPE is absolutely vital that it's safe, as I said. So only use PPE that is properly certified. That's the message that the BSIF get out there. And I feel, at the moment, it almost feels like it's a losing battle because there's a real urgency for everyone to get PPE and pressure on the government to get PPE, in but you can't just get any pp in it has to be compliant it has to do something it's meant to do it needs to be safe to use that's the message that bsaf are really really trying to raise at the moment so i'd urge you to to support that message and just make sure that any pp that you acquire is safe and compliant to use the second story i want to cover is about the return to work now, many of us will have heard Boris Johnson's address to the nation about the plans to slowly integrate us all back into work and try and return to normal. I think uh, many of us feel there's still many questions to be answered on that. But, but what has become clear is some people are starting to go back to work. The government's guidance has been if you can't work from home, do start to return to work. And that with itself obviously brings concerns and dangers. We're in the middle of this epidemic. And IOSH, the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health, um, have released their thoughts on this. And they've urged a risk intelligent return to work. Now, we've covered this story on the HSM website. And IOSH has said um, there have been reports in the media outlets that include there may be things such as physical shields and staggered shift times. But concerns have been raised about gaps in the guidance from the government. IOSH anticipates that before businesses can open workplaces up, they'll need to conduct thorough risk assessments. So it's making guidance available on this. And the latest in this is a raft of information they've got. 
that provides members and organisations with key insight and some steps they need to take before they bring people back to work. These risk assessments, IRF says, will highlight the steps businesses need to make to ensure that their premises are safe to open. Measures are likely to include redesigning processes to allow for physical distancing, so social distancing, as many of us would know it as, and also adequate ventilation, plant inspection, hygiene arrangement, and PPE equipment in their planning. There's awareness training around COVID-19 and ongoing monitoring and mental health support should also be factored into this. So if you are an employer like myself and we're already thinking about how we're going to bring our staff back to the workplace when needed. I mean, our decision is that right now people can work from home, so they should stay working from home. But for many workplaces, that's not practical. Uh, if you're working on a production line, you're working in construction, they need their staff in. So I would urge everybody to go to the IOSH website and have a look at the, um, the guidance they're saying. But the key message here is you need to take out an intelligent risk assessment beforehand. And one of the things that we will go into now is an interview with Kevin Bridges, uh, who's head of health and safety for Pints and Masons. And he's going to focus on the interview I've done with him on your legal obligations, your legal responsibilities in relation to health and safety with COVID-19 in mind. So I spoke to Kevin earlier today and here's what he had to say. Good morning, Kevin. How are you? Very well, thank you. Well, thanks for joining us today. And for those of you that don't know, uh, Kevin writes a regular column for Health and Safety Matters magazine. So you can see that in, in every issue. And we thought natural progression from that would be to pose some questions to him live on the second edition of the podcast. So, Kevin, we can't ignore that the world is very different since the last time that we spoke um, due to the coronavirus epidemic. Can I just get your opinion on how it's affecting health and safety laws and your responsibilities in relation to this under the UK health and safety laws? Sure, Mark. Yes. Well, um COVID-19 or coronavirus uh, is first and foremost, and it's important to remember that it is first and foremost a public health risk and uh, needs to be managed as such in the workplace, just like any other risk. So uh, whilst it's new and much is still unknown about it, um, its management really does need to be carried out using tried and tested principles. Um, in terms of health and safety laws itself, all of the existing statutory duties that exist on employers under health and safety legislation, whether that be the 74 Health and Safety at Work Act or regulations, have not changed at all as a result of either the Coronavirus Act or COVID-19 related regulations. Um, the legal requirement remains one of doing all that is reasonably practicable to eliminate or manage risks to health and safety. And those include, and that includes the risks arising from um, the virus. So because the laws are unchanged by the coronavirus related uh, legislation, um, th those risks to employees need to be managed in the usual way. And that is based on risk assessment risk assessment and the hierarchy of control measures that are needed to demonstrate that everything reasonably practicable is being done to eliminate or mitigate the spread of the virus in the workplace. And that's in compliance with the normal duties that employers have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So in short, the, the principles of good health and safety risk management must be Applied, they remain the same, and there's no anticipated change to that mark going forward. Risk assessment will be an employer's blueprint for action, whether it comes to keeping sites or operations open or uh, returning people to work and reopening uh, premises. So, obviously, across the United Kingdom, certainly Northern Ireland, there are often different laws in relation to health and safety. So, from what you've just covered, is this, are you saying uh, the responsibilities are the same uh, across the United Kingdom or is there any differences in take on this across the devolved countries? Well, that's a very good question, Mark, because it's not uh, entirely straightforward. And, and I don't think we've got the time today to go into all of the detail around that. But it's certainly fair to say that health and safety laws across the UK are the same. 
they've always had application uh, to a great extent across most of the uh, UK jurisdictions. Um, but the coronavirus legislation does differ across the different uh, devolved administrations and countries of the United Kingdom, as does the guidance. So, for example, in Scotland and Wales, the coronavirus uh, legislation makes law a requirement to take reasonable measures to ensure social distancing, whereas in the uh, in England, that is Public Health England guidance, and it appears in many industry guidance as well, but it is only guidance in England to ensure uh, social distancing. It's a very high uh, authoritative guidance, but it is only that. It's not legislative, it's not law. Um, whereas in Scotland and in Wales, with some variations between them, but, but the basic premise is that social distancing is part of their coronavirus regulations and you must take reasonable measures to ensure social distancing. So it is important to have regard not only to the health and safety legislation that exists, but also the relevant COVID-19 coronavirus legislation in the countries in which you are operating and also the relevant guidance. Because in, I think my view is that HSC will expect you to, in order to discharge your duties and do what's reasonably practicable, have regard not only to your health and safety legal obligations, but also the, the laws of Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland to the extent that they apply and the, that uh, wealth of guidance that has been issued by both the government, devolved administrations and industry bodies. Well, obviously, the guidance from the government right now isn't altogether clear in terms of how we can all return to some form of normality over time. But people are starting to return to the workplace, be it construction workers or people who have got roles where they can't do them from home. So that raises the question, we discussed it earlier off air, um, Kevin, that do you think things are going to change under Riddle in terms of what's reportable in relation to COVID-19? Is it something that you're going to have to report under that? Well, Riddle or the reporting of injuries, diseases and dangerous occurrence regulations, like I've said previously, still applies under the new environment in which we're working in. No health and safety laws have been disapplied as a result of COVID-19. So an employer will still have an obligation as the responsible person under Riddle to report those events that satisfy the relevant test. So to ensure compliance with Riddle, um, whilst also avoiding any unnecessary reporting, the responsible person, typically the employer, must first understand what the potential triggers for reporting um, there are, and then examine the facts on a case-by-case -case basis to determine whether each limb of that uh, relevant threshold has been met. And COVID-19 falls within potentially three areas of riddle. It could be a dangerous occurrence, it might be a diagnosis of a disease, or it might be a workplace fatality. Any, any one of those might result in a reporting obligation. Uh, and the Health and Safety Executive have, have classified COVID-19 as a biological agent. And that's important because that's where the disease aspect um, comes in. There's two uh, important considerations, Mark, if I might just talk about those. One is that um, for a disease, and the most likely environments where you'll see an obligation to report is less so the dangerous occurrence. That might be more confined to laboratories or or, or that sort of environment, research centres. Diseases and uh, fatalities might arise most uh, obviously within a, the, perhaps the healthcare uh, sector, but we mustn't forget that it could also arise within construction, facilities management, retail, rate waste, transport, many other sectors it could apply. So two crucial things to remember is that one, there has to be for a disease, a uh, reportable disease to arise, for that trigger to apply, um, there has to be a written medical diagnosis of COVID-19. So just because somebody's demonstrating symptoms wouldn't be enough. There has to be a positive test result uh, for the duty to apply. And the second 
uh, Lim, is that the requirement to report doesn't arise simply by virtue of there being a person at work. Um, there has to be a nexus or likely link between the dangerous occurrence, disease or death, and the work activity or the environment that was in, in existence at the time. And that might involve a forensic analysis of all of the evidence that was available regarding the nature and the method of the work that was being carried out to determine whether that test had been met or not. Or not. So unfortunately, it's not a, a, an easy uh, question to uh, process. Riddle in itself is not always easy to interpret. It's not a huge amount of guidance. The HSC have issued some guidance, but any uh, possible work-related uh, case of disease, dangerous occurrence, or uh, a, a death, a fatality, does need to be care carefully considered and documented as to whether you decide, uh, regardless of whether you decide to report it or not. It does require a careful analysis of the evidence. Well, one aspect that we haven't talked about uh, is, as we all know, more and more of us are working from home at the moment. And when you look at something like the, dis um, the display screen equipment regulations for office workers, what's your opinion on the HSC guidance on home working? Uh, does it need updating? And perhaps should there be more work stage, so should there be more workstation assessments? Well, this is really, I think, quite important, Mark, because many of us might work in an office environment and workstation assessments will be undertaken by uh, our employer um, using various tools, whether that's um, online or, or questionnaires. And I think we often take that for granted. You know, we've now been thrown, uh, many of us have been thrown into a different environment of not working from home of an evening or of an occasional weekend or one day a week, but all time working from home. And many of us have laptops and not uh, proper uh, desks and workstations. And I think this is an area that's quite easy to overlook. Uh, and the relevant legislation is the display screen equipment uh, regulations. And the rules governing DSE, if I can refer to as that, continue to apply, consistent with what I've said throughout, despite this current global crisis. So employers should review, in my view, their compliance with rules regarding DSE, again, afresh, given the shift to remote working in light of the coronavirus um, pandemic. Now, the HSC issued quite early on, has to be said, um, some guidance that there is no increased risk from DSE work for those working at home temporarily, so that in situation in that situation, employers don't need to uh, carry out a home station assessment. The crucial phrase there is temporary, and how does one define that? Um, Early on in this, nobody really knew how long we would be working from home, but we've already been working from home now for many weeks, and it could be for some people months whilst they're working at home. When does it move from temporary into beyond that, longer than temporary, such that the requirements of DSC and crucially that requirement to do a workstation assessment kicks in? For, for me, I don't want to sort of descend into uh, uh, semantics of when uh, it is or isn't temporary. For me, my view is that um, it is now, you know, well advised uh, for employers to take the steps, uh, to take steps necessary to ensure compliance with DSE, particularly for those working at home. So display screen equipment, work is, workstation assessments, I think are really important to be undertaken. And those working from home should be given the tools to be able to to do that and employers to respond if the working environment is such that people's health and, and very significant uh, health risks arise from uh, poor posture, spending too long looking at a screen, screen not taking um, time a workstation assessment. I think it's absolutely crucial now, if it hasn't been done before, as this period continues and people aren't necessarily returning to the office. But in addition to that, providing um, support, information, guidance to employees so that they don't spend too long looking at uh, their screen and they do they do take, take time away from it. 
and, and, and that's not only important for DSE, but also for taking account of people's well-being uh, and their potential isolation, I think is an also important part of uh, risk assessment and review of how people are working at home during this uh, changing working environment. So, Kevin, thanks for joining us today. Um, if people want to get in touch with you or Pints and Masons, because obviously you're head of health and safety and a partner at Pints and Masons, if they want any legal advice, how can they get in touch with you or Pints and Masons? Feel free to contact me uh, for any advice uh, on any issue relating to health and safety or COVID-19. Riddle, we're seeing in particular uh, lots of queries and the best way to get hold of me is via my uh, via email, which is kevin.bridges at pinsentmasons.com. Thanks for joining us today, Kevin. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. As always, a great insight by Kevin, who's someone that has been in the health and safety profession for a long time on the legal side, and we're delighted that he was able to join us. And you can see more from Kevin, as I said earlier, because he does a regular column at HSM. But let's refocus now on some news stories, a couple of news stories, and really quite sad one um, I want to come up with right now. And we cover this on the HSM website, which is hsmsearch.com. And this story focuses on the construction sector. And the headline of the article is, A quarter of construction workers consider suicide. A new report by the Chartered Institute of Building, which is the CIOB, has found that one in four construction workers have considered suicide. The research reveals that 26% of construction industry professionals thought about taking their own lives in 2019. This is before the COVID-19 pandemic had hit the country and the sector. And 97% stressed that at least once in the last year they they considered stress is a major issue in such things such as job insecurity, long hours, time away from families, lack of support from HR, late payments, all contributed to this silent crisis, according to Professor Charles Igbu, who is a CIB president. The CIB report, which is called Understanding Mental Health in the Built Environment, also highlights the role gender differences play in the mental health side of things. Female construction workers often have to work with poor or no toilet facilities and inadequate sanitary conditions, while men frequently feel unable to discuss their mental health due to hyper-masculine expectations of how they should behave. This is pretty grim reading so far. The report, which is being published as part of Mental Health Awareness Week, which took place on the 18th to 24th of May, which could well be now if, uh, if you're listening to this on the day that we came out, finds that 56% of construction professionals work for organisations with no policies on mental health in the workplace. The CIOEB produced this report to highlight the state of mental health in the industry and has uncovered what they're calling the silent crisis that affects so many construction workers' day-to-day lives. But the report does contain wide-ranging recommendations that can help tackle this crisis. So one of the things it does is it calls on construction firms to do more to identify risks, Improve awareness through training and events for staff, encourage more open discussion of mental health and well-being in the workplace and provide specialist support services. Larger firms should also consider how they can support other businesses in their supply chain. Recommendations for the government, though, include reviewing the Construction Skills Certificate Scheme, which is the CSCS, to include a mental health support aspect. Updating the Health and Safety First Aid Regulations, 1981, to ensure that workplaces make provision for mental health first aid and implementing the recommendations of the government's own thriving at work report from 2017 which looked at mental health in the workplace so i said this is a truly sad story you know one in four construction workers in 2019 consider taking their own life from from such a variety of reasons we just covered so i would urge anybody that uh, is in a construction sector listening to this that does suffer um with such huge anxieties and stress and depression do talk to your employers, do, 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 do speak out. Mental health is is not an embarrassing subject. It's something that is truly pivotal. It's it's now such a more anticipated and expected part of a health and safety manager's role. The health and safety manager's role has widened from just a traditional health and safety accident to, to mental health and well-being. So don't suffer in silence. There's plenty of people that you can speak to if you don't want to speak to your employer. But... That is a truly staggering and very, very sad statistic. So I would encourage everyone to read a bit more into that report. You can obviously read it on our website, but, you know, go to the Chartered Institute of Buildings website and and read it in full. Our final news story for this episode is 
come from Unite Union. The union has urged public transport capacity rules are needed in the wake of this COVID-19 epidemic. The Unite Union has called on the government to protect workers by introducing a maximum public transport capacity rules and make it a requirement for people to wear face masks. Unite has warned that the government must establish clear rules about maximum passenger capacity and making the wearing of face masks compulsory to keep buses and other forms of public transport safe during this epidemic. The union has issued its warning following the government's publishing of the safer transport guidance for operators. This document, which provides basic guidance for employers in protecting passengers and workers during the pandemic, Unite also believes the guidance on risk assessment must be stricter. Risk assessments, Unite say, must be detailed, dynamic, strictly adhered to and available to workers and regularly updated. So Unite's National Officer for Passenger Transport, Bobby Morton, said, Unite is very concerned that the document lacks clarity with regard to the maximum capacity of passengers allowed on buses and trams. If the government is serious about ensuring social distancing is maintained, there must be strict rules on maximum capacity. It's not good enough to recommend face coverings. They need to become mandatory on public transport. This will dramatically reduce the risk of COVID-19 being transmitted. I think that's a pretty clear and easy message for us to all understand. Uh, Right now, there is a lot of uncertainty, as I said earlier, about how it's going to work with people returning to work. Many of you will have seen on the news last week that there's expected to be a big increase in public transport in London and... The London Underground is attempting to run at 10% capacity. But we all saw the images at the start of the pandemic of packed underground trains and buses. And it's very, very difficult to bring in a two metre social distancing rule unless you're very, very um, strict on this. And if the government wants to keep this R rate down, it's saying that adhering to social distancing is still key because we don't want to have a second peak or a second spike. So... What the union has clearly said here is the only way to do that is to drastically reduce capacity on buses and trams, which London Underground, as I said, have done, and also ensuring that everyone's wearing face masks. So once again, it'll be interesting as we all start to return to the new normal of how we're going to how we're going to do this. And, you know, the union and obviously along with other unions like the TUC are working very closely with the government and, and speaking very passionately, as they should do, for protection not just of their workforce, but also of the, the customers, you know, the passengers that have to interact around the staff that work on public transport. So, yeah, it's issues like this are going to keep coming up, and it's why PPE is as important as ever. And as I said earlier, and I've said this to many PPE manufacturers, I, I don't think many of the of the public knew what PPE stood for before COVID-19 was in now and now it's uh, it's an acronym that everybody knows and it comes back to the conversation we had at the start of this podcast that we need to make sure that people are supplied with safe and adequate PPE so and if you want more information on how to ensure that other than the webinar I mentioned earlier go to the BSIF website so they've got a register safety supplier scheme and all of the people there are, are compliant. So speaking of PPE, it's about this time that we normally do an interview with a major manufacturer. And I'm delighted this week to be joined by Sam Hill, who's the managing director of Delta Plus. I sat down with Sam earlier and here's what he had to say. Afternoon, Sam. Thanks for joining us. How are you? Very well. Very well. Thank you, Mark. Uh, interesting to see for the first time people actually know what to do for a living. After 10 years in the marketplace, people now know what PPE means. So it's been uh, it's quite interesting. I want to talk to people and I say I'm a PPE industry guy and they uh, immediately know what, uh, what I'm saying. So very interesting that PPE is now the topic of the world. Well, I know you're you're really passionate about your business. That that's shone every time that we've spoken. So let's shed a bit of light for those that aren't familiar with Delta Plus. Um, what's been your key product focus so far this year, Sam? Well, due to the obviously the COVID situation, it's really elevated our respiratory sales in Delta. Um, a lot of people all know Delta Plus is a head to toe player in the PPE marketplace. For eight years now, we've been in our premises in, in Blackburn, where we've had the stock available for next day delivery. Um, but 60% of our sales were on footwear and high safety before COVID in the, in the UK. In the UK, So 
And we are a respiratory manufacturer with two factories, one in Brazil and one in China, making 40 million masks per year, but in the UK, very low on our respiratory. So it's really elevated our position as a, as a res- respiratory provider, respiratory professional manufacturer. And it's been um, unbelievable, really. You know, we were at record sales in February and March, and we had our worst ever month in April due to the uh, rupture in the supply chain, you know. So uh, respiratory has definitely been the focus, and it will be the focus going forward as our staff are fit to fit accredited professionals our video on face fit testing is on the fit to fit website so we were already working on uh, respiratory for, for the UK strategy um, and this has just come along and really elevated our focus on that so um, that's that's what we're going to be looking at for the next uh, for the foreseeable future really to continue to uh, maximize our opportunities on building our brand as a respiratory true manufacturer We'll come back in a moment to what's next in your product pipeline, because I know you've had to react quickly to the current climate. But there's a bit of a misconception at the moment that PPE manufacturers must be having an absolute whale of a time because, you know, with this terrible <coughs> pandemic, there's a, a mass need for PPE. Yeah. But, but you, you've hit the nail on, on the head there. You say you went from a record sales in, in March to just absolute yeah. catastrophe in, yeah, in April. Terrible. Can you explain why that was and what's happened? In April, it was 50% down and just because the products that we would normally, of course, our supply chain in, in the UK, our stock portfolio is built on what we normally sell and high safety in footwear is, is, what, is what we're known for, really. So we just couldn't get the stock in fast enough compared to what, what people was asking for. You know, the phones didn't stop ringing. We've not had to furlough many people in our, in our business, but we just couldn't get the stock in quick enough, you know. We we did, we did really we what I made sure was that the stock went to the right place. Um, my wife works in the NHS and she she came home in February and I asked her to show me the PPE that uh, she'd been issued with and it, it was it was adequate but we didn't have any straight away. So straight away the alarm bells are ringing for me. Obviously being my wife, so I immediately organised PPE to to her place of work and uh, made sure that um, it always went to the right place going forward but we, we we ran out we just ran out in april um well where we are now because we own the two factories that are producing the masks we are in control of our own destiny so the supply chain is now recovering so i'm as we talk today mark i'm about two weeks away from being back in, in stock and then we should be okay to service our customers for the next um, two months and then after two months we should be uh fully back with with buffer stocks in in in, uh, in place so uh things are things are looking up a little bit but at the moment it's just crazy because the uh, amount of counterfeit products and your webinar last last week which i uh really enjoyed with uh the bsif one thing that really stuck out to me was the one of alan's messages about the number of companies in china which had um been registered in 2020 20,000 new companies with the word mask in the name. That just shows you the amount of um, inferior product not fit for purpose, which has ended up on our shores at the moment. So I do feel a little bit for the distributors at the moment where there's a real shortage of stock supply in the market, but they must, they've got customers to serve. So it's difficult and they've got to keep the businesses alive, of course. So difficult time to be a distributor at the moment because well, we should see things improve as the uh, companies start to come back to work. And I think obviously my footwear will start to move again and hopefully the other parts of our, our product portfolio should start to move again. So, uh, but yeah, April was, was, was tough for us. It's not all uh, roses, shall we say, in the, in the PP and health, health and safety market at the moment, that's for sure. But um, I think in the next two years, I think we should, we will see massive more emphasis on PPE. Everybody knows what it is now. Um, and, you know, I think we're in a good position to hopefully maximise on the opportunities that are going to present themselves for us. I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head there. It was a truly terrifying statistic that uh, Alan Murray from the BSIF came up with um, to do the amount of uh, companies in China that would mask in. Now, you're a very proactive member of the British Safety Industry Federation, so I'm pretty sure I know the answer to, to my next question will be kind of what we've touched on so I was going to ask you what do you think the key issues facing the health and safety market moving forwards will be, but I suspect you're probably going to say making sure that um, 
only quality product and compliant mm. product is in the market. Absolutely. It's got to be got to be number one. There's, there's lots of my uh, most important customers, to be honest, my important distributor customers have, have made the decision to procure some of the uh, K95 products and, you know, them are they want to run their own business. But um, that is the, the biggest risk out there. And uh, I think it's the biggest uh, danger that we've got is that there's a lot of products out there which is not fit for purpose at the moment, you know. But I think the quality manufacturers such as as ourselves and there's lots of other fantastic companies out there we are getting stock here fast you know we are going to be that's what's really elevated delta plus in the, in the uk because we are 265 million turnover not many people know that and we are a real real player but in the uk it's been a tough market for us to be honest but um i think how fast we've reacted to this situation and the level of stock that we're getting in is make people realize that actually you know delta are a significant so we're going to help we're going to lead the charge i think with some of the real quality brands at getting the good quality product out there getting the right training hopefully work with the bsif to continue to weed out the uh bad shall we say products out there well let's circle back to that i promised that we would uh, talk about how you're going to address that um so what is next in delta Plus's product pipeline what have you got planned moving forwards? Um, well, there was a real success last year with the Onyx helmet that we brought out with the uh, the Arc Flash product. We managed to get um, some leading European utility companies on board globally with, with that product. So that's, um, again, put our emphasis to all above the net, really. Um, we do manufacture above the net products. Um, so that's a real core area for us. We're also trying to look to bring out more eco-friendly type of products. So obviously, simple things like packaging, etc. We've already that's already done in, in our in our products portfolio manufacturing process. But we have an R and D facility, um, which we invest about four million pounds a year on research and development. We have our own testing laboratories. So our next product portfolio is lo- looking more about eco-friendly type of products, so different kind of materials, Cecil and hand protection. That's a big, big area for us, minimising the skin irritation and um, more in- innovative yarns. I've recently developed um, some put level F products, which took a while, but we've got there. Um, the product portfolio is cut level F hand protection. There's a big range is coming. We've already got two products today, but a big range of products are coming out with cut level F certification, which will be massive for us. We're also investing a lot in training. We have a training subsidiary where we've developed um, a course, which is going to be free for our Free at the moment during the COVID crisis, but there probably will be a, a charge going forward. It's cost us more than it's cost us more than one million euros to set up. Um, it's thirty six hours of PPE training with quizzes all online, some username and password. So we're going to be looking to offer more training services and more solutions to PPE and trying to uh, raise more raise more awareness about the uh, health and safety at work. Well, that make, that makes sense. I can see why training will be needed now more than ever to make sure people are using PPE properly. Now, you know, as you know, this podcast is sponsored by the Health and Safety event and Delta Plus are actually exhibiting at the Health and Safety event, which takes place on 22nd and 23rd of September 2020 at the NEC. So, Sam, if people come to your stand, what kind of things can they expect to see on that stand? Well, I think we're not going to go crazy in terms of products. Um, presenting products this time normally a delta plus stand has been had too much product on there our catalog has a lot of products on there and we normally try try to promote too many things to be honest mark um, i think as the experience tells us it's not really worked as well as it should have done for us so we're going to be looking at more of um pushing our manufacturing message we wanted people to feel confident and to know that delta plus is, is a real high quality manufacturer so they'll have a limited number of products on there but there will be a few surprises on there in terms of new products that we brought out there's one particular item of footwear that we'll be uh, introducing and um, there'll be again our cut level f products will be will be there on display so limited number of um, products but very innovative yeah we're looking forward to, to the show and hopefully getting back to normal again it'd be nice to actually stay in a hotel to be honest in the show and maybe have a or paint the two, you know. Um, yeah, we're looking very much looking forward to it and uh, building on the new relationships that we've built up just during the, the lockdown period. You know, on the phone has been going crazy and I've got some very good new relationships built in up. So I'm looking forward to meeting these people in the flesh and uh, showing them what we've got to offer. Never forbid, you know, I might actually get to watch a game of football at some point. You never know. Uh, yeah, I've not been to Scotland for a while now to, to see the mighty Dales, so looking forward to that. 
hey, listen, if the rumours are to be true, uh, my side, Oxford, might actually get promoted by the season ending now. So <laughs> something really? good's come out of all this. We're happy just to stay uh, not relegated. So it's good for me as well. So just rounding off, Sam, if people want to find out more about Delta Plus or get in touch with you, how should they do that? We've got our website, um, www.deltaplus.co.uk. We've got a uh, local team just based in the northwest of um, BP professionals so available just on the phone. Any queries or questions? But our website's pretty good. Our YouTube channel is very informative as well. You can find it on YouTube just searching for Delta Plus. Yeah, they're the, they're the main main places to get us. Well, Sam, thanks for joining us and thanks for giving us such an honest appraisal. And you've obviously clearly got a lot in the pipeline and definitely a stand to come and see at the health and safety event in September. So thanks for your time. My well, pleasure. My well, pleasure. Thank you. Well, that's all we've got time for on this edition of the Health and Safety Matters podcast. But as I've said throughout, you can see the latest news daily on our website, which is hsmsearch.com. Please do subscribe to get a free copy, a printed copy of Health and Safety Matters magazine that comes out six times a year. Or if you can't wait for that, you can look at the digital edition of the magazine. And of course, we send out an e-newsletter full of news twice a week. Do check out our webinars there the latest one with the bsaf that i mentioned a couple of times actually offers one hour of cpd so definitely worth going if you've got some time to do it we release this podcast every fortnight on a monday and we do encourage you to share it with your friends please do give us a five star rating on itunes you can always listen to us on youtube itunes google play or spotify please do spread the word now we'll be back in a couple of weeks time and i'm delighted that i'll be joined at that time by IOSH Chief Executive Beth Messenger, and also the Chief Executive of the Alchemist Group, Alan Franklin. Also, thank you to the Health and Safety event, who are the sponsors of this podcast. And if you don't know, the event takes place at the NEC Birmingham on the 22nd and 23rd of September 2020. You can register for your free pass to attend at www.healthandsafetyevent.com. Thanks for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next time on the Health and Safety Matters podcast. (music) 